everyone. This is Brian Ankney with Auto Success Magazine. I appreciate you taking the time to join me and Rick McAlee today. Uh, today we're, we're going to talk about five ways that you can use your existing CRM to immediately impact your car sales. Um, if, if just a couple of things I want to want to go through before we get started. If you have any questions, uh, you'll see on the right side of your screen there's an area for questions. If you hit the plus sign next to questions, it'll open up and you can type in any questions you have. We will hold all the questions until the end of the presentation, and then we'll address everybody, everyone's questions. Um, if you'd like to, you know, if you'd like to interact with with Rick and myself, you know, you're welcome to email us or call us, or you know, we also have a group on Facebook that's called Auto Success Webinars. On Auto Success Webinars, you, know, you just type that in on, on your search on Facebook. It'll bring it up. You can join the group. It's an open group. It's a place for you to interact with the speakers, uh, with myself. And with other attendees, uh, you know, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. And you know, you might you might get two or three steps into making a change in your own dealership and, and want to ask a question. So please feel free to do that. That's that's why we do these. They're educational, and we we, we want to help you improve your business. Um, Rick, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share this great information with everybody today. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. Hi, thanks for everybody uh, for being here. Uh, my name is Rick Mackley. I'm CEO of Drive 360 CRM. Um, Drive360 CRM is, is one of the newer CRMs um, in the system, and we are um, really built on a, um, a lot more advanced platform just because of being one of the newer CRM systems. But what I want to talk about is not so much our CRM, but talk about some of the things that you can do in the CRM space. I mean, let's be, let's be real. We're living in a space today or a world today where we're selling a lot of vehicles, um, the SARS rate last year was 17.5 million, and it's projected to be anywhere from 17.6 to 17.8 this year. And you know what? We're getting a lot of leads, we're getting a lot of phone calls, um, and we're getting a lot of opportunities to sell cars. But what's happening is we're getting a lot of phone calls and web leads and a lot of less uh, showroom traffic. So what we want to talk about today is what some of the things that we can do in a CRM that maybe can protect us and uh, the things that we can go back to the dealership and make an immediate impact. So those things today are, are very important. And, and let's talk about, first of all, the web leads coming in. You know, as I go out, and some of the things I still do today is I work with dealers and consult with them, especially some of the people I know from my consulting days and when I worked for Toyota. Um, is I see some of these email templates that are going out, and these email templates that are going out are either just straight text, or there's some of the older ones where they've just inserted some images or have some images coming from some web servers, or they're still using the same web templates that are going out from you know three or four years ago, which at that time were pretty nice little web templates. But what's happening is the the devices that are being used today. Um, are a lot different than what they were being used, um, uh, say, three or four years ago. As a matter of fact, the study that was done by Comscore um, in April of 2014 was that um, the, the tablet uh, organization where PCs have stayed relatively flat at a 7% increase. And so what's happened now is um, people are viewing information through multiple devices. And with that in mind, when you're sending out an email to a customer, either be um, a initial response from a web lead or a multiple response or a follow-up, or more importantly, a automated response through your CRM that has a trigger set up or a business rule set up, you might want to ask yourself, what does that look like to the customer? And more importantly, is that a responsive uh, template? And let's talk about what is a responsive template. So I'm going to bring one over here. And for some of you that already know what a responsive template looks like, then you know this is maybe not news to you. But there's a difference between an adaptive uh, template and a responsive template. A responsive aligns itself differently as it looks on a device. As you can see right here, see how it is aligning itself differently as the resolution changes. When a customer gets this on a tablet, it's going to lay itself out differently. When it's on a smartphone, it's going to lay out differently. When it's on a 
um, a web browser, it's going to lay out differently. When it comes to your Outlook or something of that nature, it's going to look differently. And so what you want it to be able to do is to be able to give the customer the ability to read the whole message um, and, um, and, and deliver them the information that's pertinent and relevant to the, to the information that they're requesting. Again, what we see is, um, is templates and or email messages that go out that sometimes aren't relevant, but more importantly, um, that are not being able to be viewed um, in an email um, that the customer gets back. And so let's talk about why this information is really important. So some of the things is if you look at um, why a responsive template is important. Number one, they have a higher open rate. Customers are more likely to open up an email if it's a responsive in design. So that means that more people are going to read your message. So what's going to happen is they're much more likely to respond to your email by having a responsive template. And so building a responsive template takes a little bit more work, but more importantly, um, it's going to get you um, a better response from your customer. Another thing that occurs, um, unless it's an older Outlook system, um, it's going to have a lot less chance of going to spam. Um, it's also um, going to be a lot more re relevant to the message if designed right. And so now you can have, again, a customer that is more likely to respond to you. Um, and if they can be read, in, like I said earlier, on all these different devices, whether it be an iPad Pro, which is huge. I think they're 12.9 inches um, readable area. Um, or a smartphone like uh, the old 4Gs or the Androids or some of the even smaller phones um, or the bigger, the, you know, the, the 6Ss and the 6 Pluses and um, the, the Nexus or the, the Galaxy 7s that are out now and these huge um, phablets and, and the things that are out now. So, um, customers are having different sizes of devices. And so the last thing you wanted to do is really look and lay out horribly. So responsive web lead templates are very important today, yet majority of people that are sending out web lead um, templates are still using the ones from two and three years ago. They may update your headers and they may update your content but at the end of the day, the, the architecture of your web leads, um, your, your, your email templates, are still the same. They are not responsive in design. So again, if they're not um, one that looks like this, where I can adjust this depending on the size of the device I'm using, then it's not really going to get read because it is something that is going to cut off and so it's not going to have the ability to read the customer. So if it's an image that is, in theory, responsive, again, it's going to start shrinking that image down so that it is relevant to I can read all the information I need. So as you can see, these links right here or these social links right here or these contact information, all these things can be built and read in a linear approach versus now when I open it all the way, it now has everything on the side and on the left with the text boxes and all the other things. So it gives us the ability to be able to have that. And so that's one, that's step one. That's something that you can go back right now and whoever designs your templates to have them build out your responsive templates. Um, there's many of companies that will build out your templates in a responsive design. You may spend a little money building these templates as a responsive, but I can promise you that if you go out and get these built in a responsive area, that you're going to get more people responding back to you, more people coming in your door, and more people buying cars from you. I don't care what CRM or lead management you're doing. This system can be done because it's just copy and pasting. So how you do that is it's your HTML, but what happens with responsive is your HTML5 um, is what it is now, and your CSS, your cascading style script, 
um, becomes your CSS3, they're embedded into one, one code. Um, and so it all becomes all together and it works within a uniformity. And then those scripts become where it becomes uh, responsive in nature. So find somebody that can build these for you and get them in the system. And then when you make these out, make sure your templates, make sure your templates are relevant. Make sure that initial response, that if it's a specific vehicle, that you have one that shows information about that vehicle. Make sure that if it's something to do with a specific lead like TrueCar or uh, Auto Trader Marketplace or something like that, make sure it talks about that and make sure it represents that and make sure it's relevant, but again, make sure it's, re it's responsive. So that's the first thing you can go back and, and handle your leads and make sure that, um, that this is handled. And, and really, a lot of CRMs today, I think, um, I hope, are building out their template library to have a responsive uh, structure in there. Then let's talk about the next thing. Let's get you know, managers back involved um, in the system. And here's why. These are statistics that are out there today. And again, these are not my statistics. These are statistics that are out there. And I talked about this just last week at, uh, the, uh, at Denver at the Innovative Dealers Summit. And these are very alarming statistics, but these are true statistics. Getting the managers involved with the salespeople so that these statistics can get back up. Because if we've got all these uh, CRMs out there and everything going on as it is, why do we have these statistics? Well, we've got to get back engaged and get our CRMs being the dominant uh, software out there, not just the BDC tool. It needs to be involved in the service, the sales, the BDC, and quite frankly, every department of the dealership. Management involvement has to be there because 48% of the salespeople never follow up with the prospect. You know what they expect? They expect um, uh, they expect uh, this the customer to either you know maybe I'll I'll touch base with them and then move on. You know what? Because we're selling 17.5 million cars last year, and we're going to be a whole lot more this year. But I can promise you, if we don't fix this today, next year is going to be lower, and the following year is going to be lower. It's historic historically that's what happens. We reach a peak and we go down. We're at the peak right now. I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but here's what's going to happen. We're at the peak right now. Ask all the people, all the analysts, they're telling you this is 2016 the peak. We've got to get in our CRM and we've got to manage our customers. 48%, that's almost half the people don't even get followed up that visit our showroom um, and don't buy a car. 25% of our salespeople um, make a second attempt and stop. And then 12% of the salespeople make more than 3% contacts. So if your manager's on here, um, you got to get involved with these salespeople and you got to look at what they're doing each day, whether that's a one-on-one, -on -one, whether that's looking at what they're doing. Some of you, you know, that are great managers are already doing this, but some of you that aren't, you got to get in there and you got to manage. 80% of managing is managing activity. 20% is, 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 is doing, um, which is desk and deals and things like that. 80%, that's why you're a manager and not a desking person. And so we got to manage the activity. We got to manage the outcome. Um, management involvement. When you, when, you, when you leave this webinar, go out there and look at your CRM and see what's going on with your salespeople. Take each one of your salespeople every day and look at what they're doing. Um, you know, and here's another thing. 2% of your sales are made on the first contact. So you're saying to yourself, well, I close X amount of my sales when they visit the showroom floor. That's not what I'm talking about here. If you was to aggregate everything together and you was to say all your, um, your sales contacts, all your web contacts, all your phone calls, contacts and all your contacts and you put all them together, 98% of those people don't buy at the initial contact. So you've got 98% of those people that you need to manage and then 3% after the second contact. The point being here is it takes 5 to 12 contacts before they buy. 
And so if we're not managing those activities in your CRM and we're not setting up follow-up triggers and rules to sometimes do it in spite, because remember that if 80% of the sales are made on the 5th and 12th contact, between the 5th and 12th contact, then our CRM should be doing this for us in the event that we get busy or forget. Most CRMs are not set up to do this on behalf of the dealership. A CRM is a customer relationship management tool. That is the core of what it is. Um, it should be built to be a Salesforce automation system. And simply what that is, is when one event occurs, it should start doing all these things on behalf of the dealership. It should be automated. Uh, a lot of CRMs today have become very complex in what they do, but they lose the core of what they're about. Make your CRMs work for you. Um, make it do things automatically. Um, get with your CRM people and, and say, show me your business rules and how this works. Um, and, and really go through, um, revisit your business rules because what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself um, in a couple years saying, where did all my customers go? Um, why did you buy from X or why did you buy from Z? And we've got to make sure that you guys are, 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 um, are retaining your customers because um, that's your bought and paid for. If you want to have do a little uh, a drill, um, do yourself a favor. The industry average right now is you're retaining 38%. Some do better than others. So this isn't about everybody on the call, and it's not everybody in the industry, but the industry average is a 38% retention. So that means 62% of your customers are buying elsewhere. The factories are retaining more because they've got prepaid maintenance and some of these things that are, are, are keeping them coming back. But a dealership on an average um, only retains 38% of their sales to service and sales customers. And so do yourself, um, just say how many cars have I sold in seven years and then take that and then multiply that by your average uh, um, 38% just as a math, say, say so 62% leave me, and let's say that number's 10,000, so 6,200 people leave you, and then multiply that on your average cost it takes to sell a car in advertising, and that'll tell you how much money it's going to take you to replace every one of those customers. And so use your CRM to retain those customers. And so get Managers, get involved with your salespeople and look at their CRM and really look at what they're doing. The next thing, and this is a little bit controversial, but the thing that, you know, I was in retail for 20 plus years, um, and I can tell you that the thing that I've always said to people is the pay plan is the job description. And if appointments are your focus, then appointments should be part of that pay plan. How do you measure that? You measure that in the CRM. Who's got appointments, who's confirmed those appointments, and who has got shown appointments. That should be part of your pay plan and measured in your CRM. Who's got completed tasks and who's got forgotten tasks. If that's part of what they should be doing, that should be part of their pay plan. Lead response time. If they're responsible for responding to web leads, who's responding to leads in a certain amount of time, and who's selling leads in a certain amount of time. Owner CSI, if that's part of their job description, then that should be part of their pay plan. Customer retention, if that's part of what they should be doing, then that's what should be part of their pay plan. If you expect, and especially some of the imports, a measure first service appointment. The point is, is use your CRM to measure the performance of what's expected of the salespeople. And then my point is, is use a pay plan to drive the performance might be controversial to you. You don't have to do it. I'm just saying this is one of the five this is one of the five things that if it was me, this is what I'd be doing at my dealership to drive the performance of the CRM. You know, some of you guys have 30, 40, 50,000 people sitting in your CRM. That's bought and paid for customers. And the last thing you want to do is pick up the phone to call them and follow them and say, "Oh, you did? Well, why'd you buy that?" And then it's too late. Do the math on what it takes to regain that customer after they're going to do business somewhere else. 
So that is another thing, is the pay plans. Look at what your pay plan is saying. If you're paying a, customer, a salesperson to sell a car and make gross, that's exactly what they're going to do. <clears throat> Hold your vendors accountable. Here's the thing that, that we see all the time um, in, in our company is, well, do you again integrate with so-and-so? Um, do you integrate with so-and-so? Do you integrate with so-and-so? And that so-and-so might be a one vendor that does one thing. And I come back to them and say, well, they should integrate with us. And I say that because, again, your customers live in this CRM. And most CRMs hook up with the DMS. Those two things are the most powerful systems out there. Right now, you should go to every one of your vendors and say, you need to contact my CRM company and make sure that you're talking to them, not that they should talk to you. They should be the one reaching out to your CRM to make sure that they're bringing the, the information into your CRM, not their CRM should be bringing information to them. And so it's become a very reverse process. And again, I talked about this in, um, in Denver last week where, um, where it's going to become, you're going to see this um, reverse the process. But if I was you, I would make sure that every external vendor you have um, is reporting to your CRM so that you can measure and monitor um, what's going on. So hold your vendors, your other vendors accountable to report to your CRM, to monitor what's going in your CRM. If you have an appraisal tool that's working on a third party, your appraisal tool should report to your CRM for your customer management system, not the opposite. So, um, you know, make sure that your CRMs are your centralized customer management system, not the opposite. Have an appointment culture. That's very important. In, and I've had, you know, I, I, I was at a store a couple months ago just, you know, stopping by. It's one of my friends, and I help him and do some consulting for him. Um, and uh, I, I stopped by, and we were talking about the appointment culture. And, um, and, and he said, uh, yeah well, you know, we kind of have gotten away from the appointment world. And I says, okay. I said, so um, tell me why. Well, you know, we just, we just really don't monitor it. And I said, so how it sells? He says, it's okay. I said, um, fantastic. I said, uh, so how's your service appointment world? He says, it's okay. So we went over and talked to the service advisor. And I said, how many service appointments you got today? He says, oh, I don't know. I said, well, let's pull your pre-writes. So we pulled his pre-writes. He had two. It was a big service appointment deal. I said, so let's look at your appointment times. And they were both all for 12 a.m. And, um, and so then uh, we went and talked to GSM. And we said, uh, how many appointments you got for Saturday? And this was on a Thursday. And he said he pulled up and his uh, deal and his CRM. And he didn't have any. Um, and so the thing, if you, wanna, if you want to manage your business, having an appointment culture is real simple. I remember the day when people used to think I was kind of weird, but they'd say, um, what kind of Saturday you think you're going to have? And I'd say, hold on a minute. And I'd go up to BDC and I'd look at my appointment board and I'd say, okay, I've got 50 appointments for Saturday. And of the 50 appointments, 40 were confirmed. And so I would just simply break out the formula that simply said, if 40 confirmed, 80% of them are going to show, and as many are going to buy. And so I knew, and it was almost to the T, because my culture simply said, if I had this many appointments, this many were going to be confirmed, and it's going back to the basics of blocking and tackling. You can go back to that simple, and maybe I'm too old school, but I can tell you, I, uh, it's, it's, it's the facts. If I set this many true appointments and I go back and do this, so use your CRM to measure your performance of your appointments. Setting appointments doesn't do anything, but if they're confirmed, they're even more important. And if they're confirmed by a manager, it's even better if it's done for the right way. When I say set an appointment culture, an appointment-centric culture for the sales or service department using the CRM, we're not talking about 
confirming the appointment to see if the customer is going to show up. We're talking about setting an appointment culture so that the customer feels important. That's what it is. And then the most important part about this appointment culture using your CRM, make your CRM company set up emails that or, or, or text, if you have a texting system, that does and remedies your dentist. Your dentist has the best appointment confirmation system out there. For instance, the dentist will wear you out when you have an appointment. You'll get emails, you'll get texts, you'll get opt-ins that say, you know, I'd like to remind you about your, your appointment coming up and it will send you and it will wear you out. But simply do this. When you set an appointment, it should send a trigger that goes out to your customer and says, hey, thanks for setting some time aside. Um, if you don't do that, then pick up the phone as a manager or as, a, um, as, as, as whoever and thank the customer for giving you some time. And then remind the manager or, or somebody to call that customer and thank them. Your, re, your, your show rate dramatically increases. This, is, this has been proven time and time again. Don't call the customer to say, hey, are you planning on coming in tomorrow still? Because you know what? That decreases your show rate. And I remember from many years ago that somebody asked one person, and it was a light bulb that went into my head, what's the perfect customer? And the perfect customer is an appointment that shows up on time. And so that is still true today. An appointment that shows up on time is there to buy a vehicle. And I can tell you that is something that is very important. So, you know, I don't have a pretty uh, PowerPoint. I've built 30, 40, 50, 60 PowerPoints that have all kinds of automation and everything. But I really wanted to get to five points that if you could go right now to your dealership and or, or right now when you get off this, go into your CRM and, and handle those five things, those things are going to sell you more cars. So from the point of responsive templates, Get your manager, or if you're a manager, get involved with your salespeople every day, every minute. Be 80% mentoring and, and, and coaching and 20% working on car deals. You're going to sell more car deals. Look at your pay plan and say, is that pay plan, is, does that pay plan represent the CRM and the job description? You know, hold your vendors accountable. Get, make sure that they're, they're working with the CRM company. Um, you know, make yourself an appointment culture. That's some important stuff. That's the blocking and tackling that needs to happen using your CRM to measure and monitor the performance of, um, of your, your dealership. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Rick. That, that was a great presentation. I, I, again, this is Brian Ankeny with Auto Success. Uh, I do have a few questions that, that came up for you, Rick. Um, if my dealership's CRM doesn't have responsive emails, is there a way for me to send responsive emails? Well, you're going to have to get them built from somebody. Um, there is companies out there that will build responsive, and then you can actually, most CRMs have an HTML editor that you can copy and paste the code into it. And so you can um, get a third party um, to uh, build those out for you. Um, and, you know, they could even build you a shell with your branding on it. Um, and, and go in there, but the problem is, is if they build you a shell, and then you put your own images in there, it may not um, build out the images to be responsive on that. So if your CRM company doesn't, um, my suggestion is you go out there and Google, um, um, and there is people in the automotive space that will build uh, responsive templates, um, but if they don't, you can find somebody that will build them out for you. All right. Um, how frequently should we contact BBACs? How, what was that again? Uh, how frequently should we contact BBACs? Um, BBACs should be contacted until they, I guess I don't, I'm not understanding that. I mean, BBACs. I guess it'd be somebody that, that, you know, that came in to show them, drove a car and left. So as a VBAC, they came back, you should be contacting them. I mean, it was based off of a frequency cycle of, you know, it's a showroom visit, and you should have a nurturing, so your contact schedule, that's really up to you. If it was me, I'd be looking at when a customer came back, I would look at them as the next day follow-up, and then I'd be looking at my nurturing cycle of a one-day, a three-day, a five-day, a seven-day, and then a ten-day, and then I'd go into a little bit of a nurturing cycle 
of maybe a 15-day, uh, a 30-day. But the most important thing is have an intelligent reason to call them. Just to say, hey, I'm just seeing if you made a decision. Hey, I'm just seeing if you made a decision. When you're contacting a customer, have a reason to call them. Um, you know, have you made a, dec a decision yet or, 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 or something? And, and so a lot of reasons on a BBAC is if you have a one, three, five, seven day, um, you know, ask the customer when you're contacting them. So when should I contact you next? Or what should be next? What's the next step? So give the customer the reason to contact them. And so, you know, some of the typical scheduling on a BBAC is they've came back one time. Sometimes you might want to ask that customer when they're leaving, say, you know, when should I be in touch with you again or, or something. But if you're setting up contact schedules on a BBAC for a customer, um, typically you're going to have the next day follow-up and then maybe a three-day follow-up and then a five-day or a seven-day. Um, there's really different ways to set it up if you want to do an automation type program. Um, I would also make sure you're harvesting their email and set up ticklers to go out to the customer and say, hey, just wanted to let you know. And maybe in 10 days, something goes out to the BBAC to the customer that says, hey, new inventory's arrived. Drive them back to your website and show them some new inventory um, so that it might re-engage them. So there's a lot of different ways you can do um, to re-engage that customer. Um, so it's really varying. Do you mean a phone call? Do you mean a web lead? Do you mean a text? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. But the key is to have an intelligent reason to call, email, and to have a different reason each time um, to let the customer know. Um, you know, I remember, gosh, a long time ago, um, you know, I knew what the customer was looking for, and the reason they didn't buy is I didn't have um, a crew cab um, white uh, Silverado crew cab 4x4 because they had a new fifth wheel. And so um, I kept looking for a reason to call until – that vehicle got, you know, built, um, and it was in transit, and I called and I said, you know, great news, I got the truck coming, and then I said, I'll call you in a couple of days and give you a status update, so I kept giving them a reason why I was going to call them next, so that's really up to you and the situation and why they didn't buy, and then you have an intelligent reason why to keep calling them or keep emailing them or whatever you're going to do. You know, Rick, you said something there about asking the customer when, when, what the next step would be. We had, we had an article some years ago called permission-based follow-up, where, where, where it said the same thing. It was in the magazine. It, it said, you know, ask the customer, when, when would it be most appropriate for me to call you back? You know, and, and then at that point, you're calling them back because they asked you to. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not pestering them. You're just doing what they asked you to do. I, I, that, that's a good point. Um, I got a couple, actually, there's a couple more questions here. Um, what percentage of, of the pay plan should reflect CRM? Yeah, that's a great question because you don't want it all to be that way. And we really say, you know, I think uh, a CRM should be about 30% of the pay plan. It shouldn't be all that because, you know, let's be real. You can have it all pay plan, and if you're not selling cars, that's great in your turnover. You know, last year represented the highest salesperson turnover in the history of, of, the, of the dealership space. And so that's a great question. And when people ask me that, I tell them 30%. Okay. Um, how many appointments should be the goal for each salesperson per day? Two. Two? Two appointments. Okay. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we've got for today. Um, Rick, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this information with our audience today. And everyone in attendance, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I, I know it's you know, nearing the end of the month and NADA and there's, everybody's busy, but you know, I hope, hopefully you learned some things today that you, once we finish this phone call, you can dive into your CRM and, and sell more cars. Thanks, Rick. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, I appreciate everybody's time. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope, I hope you learned something, and I look forward to, uh, to seeing you again on a future webinar. Have, have, have a great day.